All right, so before we get started with today's lesson, this is going to be a review for the exercise from the end of the last lecture. This is the full guessing game with random number and ask for play again. Now, if you did some Googling around, you probably found that the way to do that is by including the C time library and the C standard lib library. And you probably didn't know what any of this means. You just probably just copied it. And I'm going to explain to you what that means. I can't go into too much depth because this is sort of an introductory video. And I don't want to explain too much that won't make sense. But for the sake of the video, I'm going to say that SRAND means you seed the random number generator. You give it a value to start with and then it calculates all the random numbers on top of that based on the time of your system right now. So in that way, every time you start the random number generator, it has a different seed based on the time you started at. So it gives it a, a somewhat more random feel. I create a variable, I create a character called again, which I'm going to use to ask the user if they want to play again. And then I jump into this do while loop, which is asking the user whether they want to play or not again that is off the again variable before we get to that I I'll put this little format of thing guess a number between 1 and 100 and then this is the bit to generate the random number uh, to get the random number you ask for rand which is going to give you anywhere from 0 to the largest random number it can generate and then I say modulus 100 which means it's going to give it a range from anywhere between 0 and 99. You should be able to do that math. It's not too bad. That's what the modulus operator does. And then I add 1 to it. So it gives us the range from 1 to 100. And then I initialize the user guess variable. And I do this for every time you start a new game. So every time you start a new game, it generates a new random number. And it reinitializes the user guess variable. And it outputs this statement again. Now, this is the exact same bit from the last lecture. I have a loop which just tests whether or not the guess you give is the same as the number that is generated by the random number generator. I read that in, then it outputs too low or too high. If they get it right, it breaks out of this loop and it prints correct, and then it asks if you want to play again. And then I read in a character. I'm not reading in a string, I'm just reading in a single character. I print out a couple new lines, so it adds spaces between each game. If you say no, it's not you're not going to see the new lines. looks exactly the same, but if you do, it makes a formatting difference. This is all just to create a feel, or to create something that looks a little cleaner. And then here at the bottom is the do while loop. Now, I'm only checking because I'm sort of lazy, and that's sort of the way I wanted to do this. I'm only checking if the input is yes. If it's anything other than a lowercase y or an uppercase y, because there is a difference, remember, ASCII chart, there's a difference between a lowercase y and an uppercase y. If you put in anything else than that, it's going to stop running the program. So remember the advantage to the, or what separates the do while loop from the while loop is that a do while loop is guaranteed to run at least once, whereas the while loop is not. So this by putting the entire guessing game within a do while loop, it makes sure that it runs the game at least once. And if I run this, I can see guess a number between 1 and 100. I put in 50, too low, 75, too low, 90, too low, 95, too high, 93, too high, 92, 91. Oh, there it is, correct. So if I hit Y, it starts again. And I can, it's completely random. Or it's not completely random, it's pseudo random, but again, somewhat outside the scope of this video. 75 is too high, 60, too low, 65, too low, 70, 73. Ah, there it is. And if I hit no, there we go, ends the program. Now, if I run that again, and let's see if I can guess this a little quicker. It's too low, 40, too high, 35, too low. There it is. If I put in anything other than Y, so if I put in O, it ends the program. 
So that's just a little lazy thing. I could have put in something which said if it's an N, it has to break, and if it's anything else, then it should try and ask again. But this is the simplest way to do it. So that is how you write this. If you did something similar to this, good for you. If you didn't quite understand how the random number generator works, this is how that works. It's by seeding a random number generator with a number. I can put any number into this that I want, although it should be a value that changes every time you run the program, so you get a slightly more random randomness than the last time you ran it. And this is how you get a range of numbers. If I wanted this to be between 1 and 50, I would just change that to 50, or I could make it between 1 and 1,000. Or I can make it between 1 and any range I want by using this formula. So that's how you do it. Alright, so today's lesson is going to be a little different. This one's going to be talking about data structures in programming. Now, data structures are, they're essentially arrays, but they handle data in slightly different ways than arrays, which make them more useful to programming. Now, C++ has a few, and these are common to pretty much every other programming language. So let's go over them. So the first one we're going to talk about is the vector. And you do that by including vector. Now a vector is very much like an array, but like all these other data structures we're going to talk about, it's dynamically allocated, which means you don't have to say at the beginning of the program like you would an array. So if I were to create an array here, I'd have to say, I need 10 spaces for this array. Don't have to do that with dynamically allocated data structures. So to create a vector, you say vector, and then in between these arrows here, you're going to put in the data type that's going to be contained within this vector. Now this is called a template class. This is outside the scope of this last era of this course. It's going to, this is more of a C++ thing. So just this is another bit of magic so whatever data type you put in between these arrows is what you can store in this vector so you can put an int you can put a float you can put characters you can put whatever you want so we're gonna put an int in and then I'm going to call it an A or I'm gonna call it A now the way you store data or the way you put data into this vector is by saying a dot push back and then you put in some value now what this is doing is it's pushing the value 10 into the vector. And you can do this for all the values you want to put. And every time you do this, it allocates a little more space. So I can say 12, uh, push back, uh, 13, 14, whatever. Okay. Now to examine all of the data within the vector. I'm going to create a for loop. Uh, I is less than a dot size and you can actively query the vector as to how big it is so you know exactly how many steps to go through in your for loop. And you can treat the vector exactly like you would an array. So I can say a I just like you would treat an array. And so when I run this, it prints out the values in the order you put them in. You can also get the values out by saying dot at i does exactly the same thing. Now the difference is by saying dot at i there is a level of protection added. So if I put in a value into here which I cannot access which is greater than the size of the vector it creates an error it stops the program it says you shouldn't be accessing this data and it stops so it's a very nice and handy thing to have that it can detect when you've gone outside the bounds of your data structure so that's what a vector is vector is a very commonly used data structure it's very nice to hold data and it will grow and shrink as your program needs so that's the first one. Now, the next two we're going to talk about are, hmm, how can I put this? They're, they're order-specific structures. Now, the first one is called a queue. 
So you include it like that. Let me zoom in. Forgot to do that at the beginning. So include Q. And then you treat it like you did a vector. U -E -U -E. So it's got the template. So you tell it what kind of data you're going to put into it. Now a Q is a FIFO data structure. Structure. There we go. I can spell. Which is, in a, which is a first in, first out data structure. So I've got a little diagram here. So it's exactly like getting into a line to check out at a store. Whoever gets into the line first gets out of the line first, and whoever gets into the line last gets out of the line last, or whoever enqueues first, dequeues first. So this is an order maintaining data structure. It's a repetitive data structure. So the way you do this is by saying, or the way you put data into the queue is different than you put data into the vector. You say a dot push, not push back, just push. So I'm going to put in a couple values here, and I'm going to put these in in an order. And then it has similar argument, or it has similar functions to vector. So I can say a dot, or i is less than a dot size, so I can still query the size of the queue. But you don't say a dot at, or you can't treat a queue like an array, and you can't, or you can't treat it like a vector. You have to say a dot or um, c out a dot top or a dot front. So by doing this, you check whoever is at the front of the queue, and then once you've checked that, in order to move to the next data in line, you have to say a dot pop, which takes off the top uh, bit of data. So pop is similar to, or it's the same as dq, and push is the same as nq. Now the reason they're called push and pop is, well, we'll talk about that in the next data structure, but it's made to maintain a similar naming convention. So you check who's at the front of the queue, and then you pop them off. So if I run this, one, two, ah. So here's that bit of dynamic, dynamically changing data, or dynamically changing size. What's happening is, as I'm running this program, the size of the queue is shrinking. So this value is going to shrink to smaller and smaller. So it's going to print out less and less of the queue. So uh, if I run this again, it starts by printing out the first element in the queue and then popping it, and that shrinks the size. And then it prints the next. So it starts out as a size of 4. It pops one off, changes to a size of 3, and then pops another off and changes to the size of 2. Now, by the time it's at a size of 2, i is also at 2, so it stops running. So you can't use a for loop to step through a queue. What you have to do is say while a or not a dot empty so this is going to keep running while the queue is not empty it'll print it out and it prints it out in the order that I push things into the queue remember it's a FIFO data structure first in one first out last in four last out so I called this a repetitive data structure because it repeats the order which is different than the next data structure we're going to go over, which changes the order, which is very important. Now, queues are useful because it does things in the order that they arrive, which is useful for things like thread management or, well, I know you don't know what thread management is, but it's useful for, like I said, servicing things as they come in. So it handles things in order or it can even be done in a priority queue. It handles things that come in first and that are the most important. So while you may not be able to fully realize the power and potential of the queue at this moment, just realize that it keeps this order and you should be able to use it for that in a specific way. And that probably is a question that's going to pop up at the end of the section. Now, that's the second of three data structures. The last one we're going to talk about and it's probably the most interesting to this lesson, and probably the rest of this course, is the stack. So I'm going to clear this out because it no longer works. 
Now a stack is a philo data structure, which means it's a first, first in, last out. And I've got another diagram for that. This is where the push and pop thing comes in. Think of a stack as a stack of dishes. Whenever you push one on, it gets put at the bottom of the stack. And you can keep pushing dishes onto the top of the stack. And it's only when you start taking dishes off that the stack shrinks. And whenever you take a dish off, it's always the last one you put in. So whatever the last element you put into the stack is, it's the first one to come off the stack. It's the first one to get popped. And this is a very important concept that we're going to talk about later in this course. So you create a stack just like all the other data structures. Now I'm going to push, similar to all the other data structures, I'm going to push in this list of data. And then I have to treat the stack the same way I treated the queue. So while a not a dot empty. Uh, see out a dot. Now it's not a dot front. It's a dot top. Queues have fronts. Stacks have tops. Stacks also have bottoms. Queues have fronts and backs. So it's a dot top. You check whatever's at the top of the stack. And then it's a dot pop. So you pop it off the stack. Now when I run this, you note that the data is reversed. It prints out four, the last one I pushed in, and it prints out one last, the first one I pushed in. Philo, first in, one, last out. Last in, four, first out. Now the reason this is so important is, and we're going to talk about this in the next video when we talk about recursion, is that this is the way that function calls are handled. Remember when we started to talk about functions? Whenever you call a function, whenever you if I stop this, a dot pop is a function call. So whenever you call this function, the program is going to stop what it's doing here, and it has to jump into this function. But when it stops this function, or when this function ends, it has to come back to exactly where it left off. And that's what the stack is for. The stack is a, it's a backtracking data structure. So when, it may, when the program makes the jump from this line to pop, it pushes where it is onto the stack. And then when it's done here, or when it's done in the pop, it pops that off the stack and jumps right back to where it was. And every time you go deeper and deeper and deeper into function calls, it pushes more and more into the stack and has to pop more and more back off the stack in order to back up to wherever it was. So it's a retracing data structure, which again, you're going to see is very important in the next lecture. So these are the three kinds of dynamically allocating data structures in C, C++, and all sorts of other programming languages. Now, the thing to note is, whenever I was creating these data structures, I couldn't initialize them to a specific set of numbers like I could with an array. With an array, I could just say int r uh, equals 1, 2, 3, 4, three, four. yeah. There we go. I could initialize it to that. These are dynamically allocating, which means you have to push them in as the program goes and pull them out or check as they go. So there's always a give and take. There's a pro and con to whatever you choose to do in programming. And remember, you have to make it suit whatever you're doing. So that is it for this video. I will see you all in the next lesson.